In David's beautiful treatise on the Word of God, in Psalm 119, verse 105, he says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Whether you realize it or not, you are developing a worldview. Those who are a little bit older already have a pretty established worldview. We may be confirming it or reconfirming it as we go through life. Last weekend, we had our youth studies and very convicting lessons on uh, the way we ought to be and the way we ought to act in reference to online community and uh, the temptations that come along with that, with our speech and with our eyes and with our ears. And I wanted to continue thinking with the young people, but also with those of us who are still young at heart, about the importance of establishing a proper worldview recently had an opportunity to, to study with some young folks about walking and living by faith. And this issue of the need for a proper worldview is, is tantamount to real service in the Lord. Uh, and so we need to recognize that there were only two people who ever saw a perfect world. In Genesis 1 and verse 31, after God made the world, he said, indeed, it is very good. And he placed Adam and Eve into that world. They saw what perfection looked like. But everybody else, all of us, have only ever seen a broken world. If you turn with me to Romans 8 for just a moment. In Romans <coughs> chapter 8, verses 20 and 21 describe this brokenness. It was broken on purpose, as a manner of speaking. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. God allowed sin to break the creation. He placed a curse on creation because of sin. And he did that with hope, that we would see how broken this creation is, and we would long for something better, something that's beyond this creation. <laughs> the problem is, once we're standing in this broken world and looking at it through a broken lens, all we can see are broken images. There's a great uh, cartoon back before they were memes. There were these things called cartoons. And there was this far side cartoon that I used to love by a man named Gary Larson. And here we have Bernie the bell maker. And he's being commissioned to make the Liberty Bell. And at the bottom, the caption's not there, but it says, now this needs to be really great. This is the Liberty Bell after all. And the guy who's commissioning is noticing on the shelves, all the bells have cracks on them. And you probably can't see it as well in this image, but Bernie's glasses have a big crack right down the lens. <laughs> and when I'm talking about people about worldview, one of the things I like to point out is that all of us are looking at this world through a cracked lens. We've all been a part of the brokenness, and we see the world through the brokenness, and we need something to help us see properly, to help us see with clarity. And I want to suggest to you in no uncertain terms that that something is going to be the corrective lens of faith. It's going to be what God has revealed about this world that we live in. It's the only way we can possibly see the world clearly. And I want you to understand why that's an important thing to, to recognize. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, a very famous uh, uh, placement by the prophet here. He says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Our hearts are deceitful, he says in another place. In Romans chapter 1, we looked at Romans 8 a few moments ago, which is, is further down the line in Paul's thinking about this broken world. But he begins with the problem in Romans chapter 1. He's really answering the question of why is the gospel needed. He talks about in the first few verses of, of his uh, treatise in Romans chapter 1 about the fact that the gospel is necessary and the gospel is powerful for salvation to everybody who hears. But here's the reason it's needed. Romans 1 beginning at verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's really where most of us stand. We look at this word, we think we've got it figured out, but if we're starting from the broken lens view, 
If we're starting from ourselves, we can't possibly figure it out. If we've rejected God and suppressed the truth that is there and established my truth or are listening to somebody else's truth, we cannot get to the truth. It is impossible. We've got to start with the one who made the world and the one who shows us what it was meant to be as we look through his revelation. So I want to talk about this corrective lens of faith as establishing the proper worldview. And I want to talk about it in two ways. First is objective faith. That is something that begins outside of ourselves. It doesn't start with us. Subjective is us. Objective is just what it is. It's the truth. It's the faith that's been revealed by God. He's the one who made us. And since he's outside of us and he is truth and he knows the truth, he can reveal the truth to us, which can then serve as a proper guide. And that's really part of the point of the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 11. We're not going to look at the entire chapter. I would love to do that today, but we don't have time to do that. But Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3, when he talks about faith, he's speaking in the objective sense here. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. How do I know? that God made the world? Well, he tells me. That's what Genesis 1 is about. And it's repeated over and over. David in Psalm 19 talks about the creation is speaking to us. There's a language that goes out from the stars and from the sun. And then Romans 1, Paul says, it's been manifest in creation. So the fact that creation exists is proof already there's a creator. You're without excuse if you can look at the creation and say, this just randomly happened. But then by faith, by God's revelation, we know how it happened, and sort of why it happened, and what its purpose is, and why it's broken. All of these things are objective. God has revealed them to us. There is a subjective side to faith, though. We need to think about this as well. The subjective side of faith is our response to these invisible facts that have now been manifest. They've been revealed by God. Romans 1, God manifest himself in the creation, but also in the revelation about the creation. And so we live by faith, when our actions show that we believe that what God says is true. That's what we have as the rest of chapter 11 of Hebrews. <laughs> These people that heard what God said, and because they believed God instead of what their eyes were telling them, they went and acted. Noah apparently had never seen rain, and yet he builds this huge boat thinking, well, there's going to be a flood. <laughs> because God said so. He's divinely instructed. We're told in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do we know these things? He has told us. If you will diligently obey my voice, then these things will happen. That's the way that the, the setup is in the Old Testament. And we see that all through the Bible. So by faith, we respond to the facts of God's existence. The things that were invisible that he's revealed to us, we respond to. Let me put it this way. I used to study with a family who lived on the 13th floor. And uh, when I first went to visit them, they wanted to show me all around their apartment. And they took me to all the windows and they took me to their balcony. And one of the things I noticed is they had these sort of protective screens up. Not just a regular screen, but a very solid screen. And so about our third study in, I asked, do you believe in a law of gravity? <laughs> and they said, well, of course we do. I said, well, I already knew that before I asked you. And the reason I know is you acted according to your faith. You put up these protective nettings because if somebody had tripped and fallen off your balcony, you didn't think they were just going to float off into space. You thought they were going to fall because you believe in the law of gravity. You were acting consistent with your belief. That's what the subjective faith is. We believe what has been said, and so we act that way. And the importance of establishing a worldview based on what God says can, can be understood now when you recognize that whatever your faith is in, that's how you're going to act. What you believe will determine what your worldview is and where your actions are as you begin to follow that. So there's two main questions we want to ask ourselves as we look at a worldview, as we try to correct what we see with our eyes through the lens of faith. And those two questions are, does God exist? And is the Bible God's word? In a moment, I'm going to point out that we're sort of presuming both of those today. Uh, I understand that we're, we're dealing with Christians, but these are two major worldview questions. And so in Romans 1, we were already told in verses 18 through 20 that people that can look and see that there's a world and then deny that there's someone who made the world, they're without excuse. 
That's evidenced by faith, by the way. There's been a revelation about that. And so we can see that God is there, and we've been told that God is there. In Acts chapter 14, uh, Paul preaching there, uh, he talks about the fact that God has evidenced himself. And here he's speaking to pagans, as he will also in Acts chapter 17. And he starts with God the Creator in both of these uh, uh, in both of these sermons that he gives. But in Acts 14, starting at verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, that they were going to worship them, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways, Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. One of the things that atheists have a hard time wrestling with is why does good exist if things are just randomly here? That's a hard question. It's the moral issue, and it's an excellent argument for the existence of God. It's part of what has manifest his, his goodness being here. But Paul's argument is, God has left himself with proof. You know, you even reached up to these things you call gods because you know there's some other power going on behind what you can see. Well, I'm here to tell you what that is. <laughs> he is a living God, and he's the one who made us all. That was Paul's argument in Acts 14 and also in Acts 17. So does God exist? Well, you're without excuse if you can look at the creation and think there's no creator. You may not know it's the God of the Bible, you may not think of him in that way, but you better at least be digging if you can see that there's a creation. <laughs> Don't just say this randomly happened. Is the Bible God's word? You really have no way around this once you begin to look at the Bible. It's the claims it makes. You're going to have to deal with this at some time or another. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that the scriptures are inspired of God. They come from his mind, from his heart, from his mouth through the mouth of men. Uh, is the way that the scripture describes itself. It says it comes from God. First uh, Thessalonians 2.13, Paul was grateful that the Thessalonians received the things he was preaching, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. <laughs> the Bible makes this claim over and over and over again. Either it is completely rejectable or it's completely the word of God. There is no middle ground. It doesn't allow itself any middle ground. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus prayed, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There comes that issue of the worldview. Not only is all of this God's word, this is also the truth. If God has spoken it, it's truth. And so we need to wrestle with that. Again, that's really not the focus of our study today. I just want to lay those two things out as we're talking about worldview. We're going to presume that you already believe God exists or you probably wouldn't be here today. And we're going to presume that you believe the Bible is God's word. You wouldn't be here wanting to study his word the Bible, if you didn't believe it was his word. But those are two things we're going to have to be able to help others to deal with. That might be for other lessons at some point. The point I want to get to with us is that as we talk about this corrective lens of faith, as we're looking at our worldview, we need to be very careful about what we're hearing. <laughs> David said in Psalm 119 that your word is a light and a lamp for me. David was listening to God's word. It's a beautiful poem, Psalm 119. Read it sometime and think about how many times he says, oh, how I love your law, how I delight in your law. And then realize he's talking about Leviticus and Deuteronomy and some of the books that we delight in passing over so we can get to the ones that are easier to read. Those were the things David loved. Why? Because they revealed God's holiness and God's character and God's love for men. Those books are important. And we ought to be meditating on them as David. We've got to be careful what we're listening to. God has created us so that our faith comes by what we hear. He made us this way. I think it's an important thing to recognize. And we ought to consider that truth. Think about Romans 10, 17. It says that directly. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God, depending on your translation. God made us that way. He told uh, the Israelites the same thing in Deuteronomy 29, 29. He said, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But that which has been revealed belongs to us and to our children forever so that we may do all the words of this law. God is saying, listen, because what you listen to is going to change what you think about. 
In Mark chapter 4, Jesus said it this way. He's just told the parable of the sower, and the apostles and some of the other disciples are a little shaken, like, what, what are you talking about? And he tells them he speaks in parables so that some people that don't want to hear the truth will just close their ears to it. What a silly story about plants. <laughs> or they'll close their eyes to it. But the ones who really want the truth, they'll start to dig deeper. They'll be careful how they hear. And here's the way he teaches that. Mark 4, 23 uh, through 25. He finishes a parable and he always says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. By the way, that's a clue. Everybody has ears. <laughs> but if you have ears to hear, then pay attention. That's what he's saying. Listen, because this is faith building. Verses 24 and 25, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has to him, more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. The lesson, even in the parable on the sower, is pay attention to how you are listening. Pay attention to what you're listening to. Because it's where your faith comes from. Don't stop your ears up because you don't like what it sounds like. Make sure you're listening, but make sure you're listening to what God is giving you to listen to. You hear what you spend time listening to. He's telling them, take, pay attention. Listen to what I'm saying. Psalm chapter 1, or the first Psalm, verses 1 and 2, talks about the blessing of being one who, who listens, who pays attention to the things of God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in Leviticus, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Again, think about what David had on hand. He didn't have Acts. <laughs> he didn't have most of the books of the Kings and the Chronicles. He was living some of those stories. He had the law. And he's saying, that's where my delight is. And that's where the delight of the one who hears God is going to be. What are you hearing? I think it's an important question that we ought to be asking ourselves. <laughs> are we hearing TV and cable news all the time? There's a lot of people, a lot of Christians, who spend a lot of time, an inordinate amount of time, listening to TV and cable news. YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, I shudder even to mention some of these. Where do you get your information from? I put the last one on the list as the Bible because sometimes I fear that's about the order that Christians are getting their information from. Everything else, including video games, they're filling you with information. Friends. School curriculum, I know some of these you really don't have much control over, but most of these you do. And even the ones you don't have absolute control over, you can determine how much you're going to listen and how much you're going to shut them out. But the Bible ought to be where we're starting with all of this. What are you hearing? Ask yourself that question. I need to ask myself that question more often. There are times when I haven't been listening mostly to God. I've been listening to what's going on around me. When Peter was getting out of the boat to walk with Jesus, he paid more attention to what was going on around him than he did to the Lord, and it began to sink. And we are going to sink in establishing and, and confirming our worldview if we're not listening to God and delighting in his law first off. <clears throat> Think about the importance God placed on the family because of this. I love Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7. The language is beautiful. It, it's so poetic. Again, this is the law, part of the law, that David delighted in. I want you to think about the poetry in just the bland Deuteronomy law here. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Teach them diligently. I don't know what your translation says. There's a couple other ways to translate that. I've never seen one that translates the actual sense of the word. It literally means sharpen their heads with it. <laughs> it's like taking a pencil and putting a sharpie. You want their heads to come to a point because you've put so much information there that you've sharpened them against what the world's going to offer. That's the point. We need to sharpen as iron sharpens iron. That's the idea that comes later. And that's the point here. Sharpen our children. Sharpen our hearts with the Word of God. Such an important role that family plays. We're the family of God here. Uh, Grady's mentioned that. We need to remember that. We need each other for this continual sharpening so that we can be hearing the Word of God. We need to be encouraging each other to be doing that daily. So God has made us so that our faith comes from what we hear. So if God's king, 
Acts 13, 22, and also in one of the Chronicles books mentions that David was a man after God's own heart. That's in 1 Samuel. That mentions that David's a man after God's own heart. If God's king needed this lamp and this light to his path and to his feet, how much more do we need this in our day and age? I want us to concentrate for the last bit of this lesson on what David says there in Psalm 119. I want to think about what is, what is it that he's getting at in Psalm 119, 105. So I want to look at David's metaphors here of lamp and light. And to do that first, I want to turn off the lights. Imagine that we turn off all the lights in here. This would be pretty dark in here. You can see a little bit of light from the hallway. What if we plastered those windows up and we just sat here in absolute darkness for a little while? What do you think would happen? Probably somebody would start giggling. People would start fidgeting uneasily. The giggling would be a response of fear. Like, i got to make some sort of noise. It's too quiet. It's too dark. Something's not good in here. In the darkness, we begin to recognize how much we need the light. When Christopher was a, a very young child, under one year, two years of age, he had this little ball he used to like to throw into his room, and then he'd go and chase it, and he'd throw it out, and then he'd chase it, and he'd throw it back in. Well, one evening, the lights were off in his room, and he threw it in there, and he got to the door and stopped. <laughs> We'd never been talking to him about the darkness or anything like that. He just stopped, and he would not go in and get it. And we said, what's the matter? He said, afraid. <laughs> he was afraid of the darkness. You don't have to teach that. <laughs> it is natural. God intended for us to fear the darkness, and yet so many of us don't fear it as we ought to. We play with the darkness. We embrace it. We let it into our hearts. David is talking about his need for light. And if it was absolutely dark in here, it wouldn't take us long to recognize how much we need the light. The truth is, in a broken world, darkness is an uncomfortable reality. It's just there. We don't like to think about violence, sickness, death, all of those things that are the futility that the world was subject to, but every one of us has been touched by. All of us, in some way or another, have lost someone we loved. All of us. All of us have been sick or have been with people who are very, very sick. We don't like to think about it. We all hear about people that go into schools and shoot up innocent little children. In Brazil, for some reason right now, there is this sort of um, recurring theme of people going in with machetes and hacking little children up. They're not shooting them. They're hacking them up with machetes. It happened several times. This is an evil world that we live in, and we know it, and we see it. The darkness is all around us. We don't like to admit it, but evil exists. Think about it in Matthew 6, 13. Deliver us not in temptation, but keep us from the evil one. <laughs> right there, in this great positive prayer, there's a reminder that there's evil. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 16, the days are evil. Redeem the time, because the days are evil. Ephesians 6, verse 12, we wrestle against the powers of wickedness. <laughs> There's wickedness out there. Verse 13 says, be able to stand and stand strong in the evil day, taking on the armor of God. It's evil. In 1 John 5, 19, we know that we're of God, but that the world is of the wicked one. Wickedness and evil is out there. The darkness is there. We like to act like it's not. <laughs> we keep the lights on all the time. <laughs> We've got the TV or the radio or something on all the time so that we don't have to think about evil. But we ought to take some time and just sit and meditate on God's goodness and on the brokenness of this world and what it means. That'll help us to develop our worldview in the right way. Even when you think about the most enlightened of men, isn't that interesting that we call people enlightened when they have some kind of a deep thought about this world we live in? Solomon, enlightened by God, clearly. Einstein, amazing, amazing brain. Some people would consider the Pope to be enlightened because he talks about spiritual things. But all of these people, I'm not saying my judgment on any of these people, I'm just saying these are people that are considered by many to be enlightened. But they're all in darkness without God's revelation. We saw that in Romans 1 already. Professing to be wise, all of these become fools without the revelation and the light of God's word. To the Corinthians who were enamored with the philosophy of the Greeks, many of them who had come out of that uh, Greek culture where they were philosophers perhaps themselves. I love the way Paul talks about the darkness of their thinking. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And he says in verse 26, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And then he calls them out in chapter 2 and says, if they were so wise, if they knew so much, they would not have killed the Lord of glory. <laughs> they crucified the Son of God. How wise is that? <laughs> Darkness is what the wisdom of this world amounts to. <laughs> Darkness. Because they're looking at the world through a cracked lens. They're starting with themselves and they say, we figured it out. <laughs> and you cannot. Without God's revelation, you cannot. So what about those who claim to be enlightened today? It doesn't take long to have the brilliant minds of our age talking about their truth and what they see as enlightenment and leading people into devastating, devastating consequences from following the quote-unquote light of this world. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 says, there's nothing new under the sun. What men are doing today is the same darkness we saw men doing before. In Genesis, when God decides he's going to bring a flood to the world, Genesis 6, verse 5, he says, every thought of the intents of men's heart was only evil continually. <laughs> I mean, how many superlatives all through there, over and over, all, all, all can you get? The world was horrible in Genesis 6 already because we're outside of the garden already. Men are already in sin by that point. It was horrible, and God decided to destroy the world with a flood. You read the end of Romans chapter 1 about all of those sins that men are condemned for. And it reads like the headlines from something today. People want to say, well, it's just getting worse and worse. No, it's not. Men's hearts are in darkness without the light of God, and they always have been. It's not getting worse. We're just hearing about it perhaps more often. But men's hearts have grown cold. What about the men who claim to be enlightened today? Well, here's what enlightenment looks like today. You get the peer pressure to conform to what everybody else is doing. But enlightenment brings about ruined marriages, <laughs> brings about loneliness, brings about false religion, transgenderism and homosexuality. That's considered enlightened thinking. Abortion and reproductive rights, pride in every sense, political division, feminism, drug and alcohol abuse, all defended by these enlightened minds. <laughs> What we need to do is shine the light of God's word into that darkness. What does the light of God's word reveal about all of those issues? You think about all those issues that our young people are facing. Not just our young people. We're all facing these same issues as we go out into the world. Darkness that's parading itself as light and enlightened thinking is all around. We need to shine the light of God's word. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, we're told that God's divine, divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the power of the gospel. Do we believe that? Do we think that the gospel is sufficient to guide us in our lives and everything we need to do daily here and in our pursuit of godliness, the things that pertain to God? Do we believe that? Because I don't think we do. So often we think, well, that's only good for religion. And so I'll, I'll keep that on Sunday or maybe during midweek study. Life is what happens every single day. And if I'm not doing life right, I'm not going to be doing religion right. My life needs to be my worship to God. My time together with the brethren, an extension of that worship, a blessing of getting to bring that worship corporate, bring it together in the body. But if my life is not guided by God, and this is just so going through motions when we're here together today. Our worldview is not just what we do on Sundays. <laughs> Our worldview is what we think of the world on all the days in between and how much we're in the darkness in all those days in between. God's gospel will give us everything we need for life and godliness and all those in-betweens. That's where we need to be living the gospel and sharing the gospel and shining his light. So think about David's metaphors here. He says, I have a lamp to my feet. So we're in that dark room and somebody strikes a match. 
That's amazing. All of a sudden, after all that darkness, there's a little bit of light. We can see a sort of a circle of light around that person, sort of like in the image here. But how much is that person going to be able to see beyond that circle of light? Now, I imagine everybody's going to start crowding around that person because everybody wants the light. But how much can they see beyond that circle of light? Not much. Is it good to have that light? Absolutely. It's necessary. Faith in God's word will give us real help for immediate needs. But that's not all it's meant to be. That's the way some people use God's word, though. They're not interested really in knowing all the life. They just want once in a while, I need to get something fixed. And so they go, what's my blessing today? And they'll read that. And they get light for a moment. But I dare say, reading the Bible that way, you're not going to understand even the light that you're given for that moment. But it is a lamp for his feet. David needed to see where he was stepping. <laughs> What about the second thing, though? A light to my path. Both of these are necessary. My parents used to go camping in Indiana, and there's a place that had a lot of rattlesnakes where they would go. And they thought the rattlesnakes were only out during the daytime. <laughs> and so at night, they would take their little flashlight, and they would go out to the, to the bathroom, and they would hike down this trail. They knew there were rattlesnakes there, but they didn't think they were out at night. And with their little flashlight, they couldn't see much until one of the rangers came along one day and said, you know these paths are full of rattlesnakes at night. This is the place between the trees where the ground stays warmest. They all come out at night to lay on these paths. It would have been really nice to have had a light that would shine out way in front of them instead of just this sort of lantern type light they were using that could only see right where their feet were. They needed something to show them the dangers that were ahead. A lamp to our feet is necessary for, for moments, for the things we need right there. But we need a path and a clear vision. And that's really where our worldview will take us. Faith in God's word provides a real plan for future direction. That's what we need. It's good to see what's going on right here. It's even better when I can see this and also where I need to get to. And that's what God's word provides. And that's what David's talking about in this particular psalm. His worldview was based on seeing God clearly now and seeing God clearly where he's headed. So a lamp to his feet would provide light for daily immediate sight. That's what he needed. But it would also keep him from turning aside to the right or to the left. Because if all you have is that circle of light, you're going to be careful where you step, right? You're walking through the woods in the middle of the night. There may be a cliff right there that you can't see. So you're going to use that narrow path of light to keep you from turning to the right or to the left. Our reading in Deuteronomy 5 earlier talked about that concept. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand. We were told some of the kings that did the, the Lord's will did not deviate to the right or to the left. I love this blessing in Isaiah 30 that, that ties to this image. He's talking about in the restoration, when he, when he brings his people back, he's going to guide them more carefully. They're going to be willing to listen is the point. But Isaiah 30, starting at verse uh, 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. But your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. I just wanted to get to that point. See how beautiful that is, that concept? As you're walking, you'll have the light of hearing God's word so that as you begin to step and say, no, that's not the right way. It's this way. <laughs> this is the way. This is where you need to walk. And you walk in that. As you begin to deviate to the right or to the left, the word will be there and it'll, it'll whisper to you. This is the guidance of the shepherd. This is the guidance of, of God in this new promised kingdom. What a beautiful blessing that is. So Ephesians 5, we we're talking about the days being evil. The context there in Ephesians 5 is, look carefully how you walk. Look circumspectly is the word literally there. Look in all directions as you're walking, and then take careful steps, allowing the light of God's word to illuminate where you are. But a light to the path is a light for long-term vision, for direction. It would be nice to have that light right here, but we, we've got to move. We can't just stand still. And so as we're walking and trying not to step off to the right or the left, it'd be nice to know that's the direction I want to go to. And so that's what the Bible also provides. Think about working a maze or a puzzle. 
what would make it easier to solve? I, I've watched my kids. I, I love mazes and, and puzzles, and I've watched my kids work them uh, for a long time as well. What would make a maze easier to solve? <laughs> well, when you get stuck sometimes, don't you just go to the exit and work your way back, and all of a sudden, well, that, that, that's how you get there. What about when you're working a puzzle? You don't start with all those mixed up colors in the middle. You look for the edge pieces, right? You want a framework to work from. <coughs> so if you're working a maze or a puzzle, working it backwards or building the edges first always helps. God's word is like that in a sense. God's word provides a framework. God's word states the end from the beginning <laughs> so that we can see where is the direction I really want to head. That's what my worldview ought to be focusing on <laughs> is how I'm going to get there. And if I've got a worldview that's in this broken world, that's about as far as I'm going to get. I'm going to end in despair, like Nietzsche, who rejected the concept of God and then died in despair because his whole philosophy didn't give him anything to hope for. We can't do that. God is giving us hope and extending light to us. In Isaiah 41, this challenge that he lays down to the idols, I just love this. Isaiah 41, starting in verse 21 Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or evil, that we may just dis be dismayed and see it together. What a great challenge. God is the one who's revealed the past to us, when you think about it. Our history that we know the most about, the history that's been most confirmed, is all that God's revealed in the Old Testament. But he's also been able to reveal things that were centuries in the making. And at the time he's writing this, he's revealing by name uh, a king who's going to come along more than a century later. Incredible. The idols can't do that. Men's enlightened vision of the world can't do that. God can do that. He can tell you exactly where this world is headed and where you can be headed if you're willing to be with him. In Mark 13, 23, dark times were coming for the apostles, and Jesus said, See, I've told you all things beforehand, so that when they happened, you will not be shaken. <laughs> he was preparing them. There are dark things in this world, but God is preparing us for those. In John 16, 4, he told the apostles he would reveal all truth through them, that they couldn't handle everything he could tell them at the moment, but later he would tell them all things and reveal truth for them. That's what we have as we make our worldview based on what the Bible has revealed. We need a lamp for our feet. We absolutely need it. We need to know whether we're going to trip in the moment. But we really need light for the future, and we need to be planning our future based on what God has revealed. There's an anonymous saying that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. That is true. <laughs> you got to take the first step. you got to be willing to step, but you can only step where you can see. And since our journey is eternal. That's what God promises. It's not going to end when this world ends. Our journey is eternal. And my desire for you, and I hope that this lesson will help you to think that way, is that every step of yours should be in Christ. Here's the way the Apostle John puts it. I, I just love his language and love knowing how uh, intimately involved he was with Jesus. He's the one who's laying on the Lord's breast at the supper. <laughs> And he's the one who starts his gospel saying, we've seen and, and tasted and touched and held and beheld. And this is, the, this is the Lord of glory. And we were a part of this. And I just want you to be a part of this. And he says in verse 7 of 1 John 1, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's evil out there. The evil gets in us sometimes, but it can be cleansed. The light that Jesus brought and the blood that he shed will cleanse the sin if we'll walk in the light as he is in the light. And in chapter 2 and verse 6, he says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Where is your walk? What is your worldview? Are you looking at things through the lens of faith? Are you in despair because you're looking at things still through this broken world? You're broken. Sin has broken you just as sin has broken this entire world. But God wants to make you whole. He wants it so badly that he was willing to let his own son come and suffer the consequences of what sin does in this world. His son died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. We've remembered that in the Lord's Supper. We've sung about it. 
And we're going to continue thinking about that in the, in the rest of our lesson today as we worship him in thankfulness for what he's done. And if you need some help finding the light to correct your worldview and to help you be on the path, we want to help you with that. That's why we're here. We want to help each other to find the light. We want to help each other to walk in fellowship with him and with one another as we walk in the light, as he is in the light. If we can help you to do that today, we want you to know that, that we're your friends and we want to help you with that. Come forward and let us know if you have a need. We're going to stand and sing this song for your encouragement.